So uh, good evening, everybody. We're running a little bit long, so I'll try to be uh, as quick as possible. Um, uh, the title of my talk is How to Blow Stuff Up and Still Get Paid. Um, I did not realize how much of the conversation uh, across this weekend from all of the Rickover associates, the Admiral's associates, uh, was going to be about how not to blow stuff up um, and how critical and important that is. And there's a lot of similarities that run through this, both in what the professors had said um, uh, in the panel yesterday evening and, and we heard this morning. Um, I, after RSI and, and a career as a uh, gravitational wave astrophysicist at LIGO, I went to SpaceX um, and I designed sensors at SpaceX. Um, uh, that's where I get to blow some stuff up and we do still get paid for it. Uh, it means that I have good videos, so basically I'm going to shut up, or well, as much as I'm capable of doing, and um, show you guys some videos. This uh, is a launch um, from uh, December, uh, excuse me, from May of 2012, shortly after I started. It's supposed to be a launch. I promise. Um, I know how to run these things. Um, this is rolling out at Cape Canaveral uh, at, to a SpaceX launch site at the Space Launch Complex 40. Um, this happened in the middle of the night, very beautiful. Uh, happened about uh, three months after I started at SpaceX. This is the return to flight after two years not flying. The Falcon 9 rocket has uh, nine engines. Uh, it weighs about 1.1 million pounds or so. Uh, the current model has about 1.5 million pounds of thrust. Uh, each one of those engines is 450 megawatts of thermal energy. So this thing is a large nuclear power plant when it is flying. That first stage will fly for about three minutes. At the end of that, it's going, it's 100 kilometers downrange. It's at 100 kilometers altitude. It's going about 2,000 meters per second uh, when, we, when we separate. The upper stage here has got an engine that's about, a uh, nozzle that's about uh, maybe 12 feet in diameter, uh, running in vacuum. It's going to take the Dragon space capsule up to orbital velocity, seven kilometers per second. That was the entire company at the time. Uh, very exciting place to be. Uh, the, this was the first picture of the Dragon capsule from the space station, so it was beautiful. Those are the sensors that my team makes um, for docking. The Dragon births, the, the uh, robotic arm comes up and captures us. Um, we sit there with everything clear. And now it's NASA's problem. So everybody gets to start dealing with it. That was the end of a two-day mission. Some of these people didn't sleep for any of the two days. Um, uh, this is uh, um, Don Pettit, the uh, astronaut who, was, uh, who did the capture, the first time they open it. Um, we had not yet won the contract for uh, sending crew to space. I think we bought him a drink when he got home. Um, that was very nice to hear. Dragon right now is the only cargo capacity down from the space station. It brings about 3,000 kilograms of stuff down. Uh, mo the, the valuable stuff is medical type experiments, so uh, we send up mice and, and the astronauts send down things. I'll let, leave that to your imagination. Um, we recover it, lands off of San Diego. Um, we get it out of the water. Uh, that capsule is not reused, but we're now reusing Dragon capsules too. So we, we have a fleet of uh, like seven of them. We keep reflying them. Um, that was amazing, by the way. That, 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 um, it's, it's like playing on the baseball team that wins the World Series but it's got 1,000, 2,000 people on it. It was 1,800 people. SpaceX had been founded in 2002, so from 2002 to 2012, they built a nine-engine rocket and a capsule to go to the space station. Um, the problem hasn't gotten any easier. Mother Nature's still mean, um, but the tools and everything are much better than, than what, say, uh, uh, and keep in mind, uh, the Apollo project was nine years to the moon, so it's not unprecedented. Um, in fact, it it's <coughs> used to be the norm. Uh, so this is the problem. So this is tw tw 12 years of space flight now. We blew up the first three Falcon 1 rockets. Um, that was basically cutting our teeth. This one was uh, literally a, a three-second timing mistake after the stages separated. Um, the first stage accelerated and hit the, first, the second one while it, while it, and that was just venting gas. It was literally, they launched one month later because they just changed the number from, from seven seconds to 10 seconds. Good. Space flight is on a very narrow, there's, um, only one good outcome from a rocket launch, and there are a lot of bad outcomes. Each one of these explosions, this was uh, F Falcon 19 and this one was Falcon 29, uh, was somewhere between a half a billion dollar and billion dollar loss. So how do we blow things up without losing a billion dollars? 
Um, that's the trick. Uh, SpaceX has done a pretty good job. You can tell that we're now launching all the time. They just launched a couple of days ago. Um, so this is based on work from Nancy Levinson, uh, or papers that I read of Nancy Levinson, who's here at MIT and talking about safety. There's basically four models of safety and reliability. And we actually heard a lot about the first one, the defense in depth. It was lovely to hear about containment for nuclear reactors. Uh, the first thing you do if you've got something really scary is you put a million tons of concrete around it. <laughs> um, so that works, actually, it worked great in, in two, Three Mile Island. And as we heard, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, reactors aren't the best if you don't have th those systems. There is also a tremendous number of redundancy systems in, in place. Uh, second model is, and these are my terms, I, I call safety first. This is where uh, basically the auto industry is taken, for instance, where you spend of your dollars and you spend of your performance in order to ensure safety. Um, there's a reason why motorcycles are more deadly than cars. It's because if you lose a tire, you die on a motorcycle. If you lose a tire on a car, I can tell you from personal experience, you just let off the gas and you pull over slowly, and then you step out and you fix it. Um, so cars can do that. Um, there are places in our economy that you cannot do that. You can't just keep adding wheels or engines or whatever to an airplane and pretty soon it won't get off the ground anymore. Uh, so you have a model, a practice makes perfect model. Um, you make a bunch of identical airplanes, you test them all, and then you have a regulatory body and a companies, very good companies, that uh, take every single incident and report it and apply those lessons learned to the fleet. So when we're talking about uh, Rick over and, and, and how he works, I mean, I see these things every day in aerospace. Um, I actually now see them every day in medicine. I, I know Dr. Dr. Ryan was saying where, um, you know, when you see a nurse, uh, you know, write down, like, cut off this arm and then somebody else checks it, you know, like, that kind of stuff comes from these high reliability engineering things. So the fleet safety. Um, but sometimes, frankly, um, you're just stuck. Um, rockets, you press a button and they fly into space and then that's it, they're done. So you don't get fleet reliability out of them. Um, they are incredibly margin dependent. You can't just throw safety things onto them. You have to be extraordinarily careful about how you add redundancy and things like that. And again, this uh, sounds very familiar to nuclear submarines. Uh, you know, once you turn that reactor on and you go into water, it better all work, <laughs> right? Um, so I, I, love the, I love the similarities here. Um, and the, the real problem is actually uh, what we call, what I think of as the tyranny of statistics. Um, uh, if you're gonna do a, if you're gonna prove to yourself that this thing is valuable, you want to do a lot of tests. You want to launch a lot of $100 million launches of rockets. No, you don't, you don't get to do that. <laughs> um, and this is a binomial nomograph. This is actually from the um, uh, Department of Defense uh, 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 Test and an Evaluation Center where they try to say how many trials do you actually need to do to have confidence that the outcome you are claiming is, is valid. And there's some really notable places like with the M16 and things where like people argued for decades over whether this kind of testing was correct. Uh, and basically, for us to launch an Air Force payload, we have to convince the Air Force that we have a probability of failure less than 10% and that we are more or less 50% confident in our answer about that. What do I mean by that? I mean that you're drawing from a distribution, that you're trying to understand what the underlying distribution is by testing. Um, and you're going to get a, you're going to, you know, you're going to do 10 trials. Well, let me give you an example. If you flip a coin five times, 3%, uh, I think it's five times, it might be four times, 3% of the time it's going to come up either heads, all heads, all five trials. So 3% of the time, even though it was a 50-50 coin, you just measured it was perfect. You know, and so this is, an, this is a question about like, what is the true underlying number and how good was your test at telling it. So for instance, up here, if your failure probability for the Air Force, they want 10% of 50% confidence level, that means that we have to launch seven times with zero failures in order to be sure about that 10% number. On the other hand, if we were to launch, uh, let's see, if we were to have 10 failures, that's this line here, well, that would correspond to something that looks like 100 launches, which would make sense, right? You, you, you know at that point where your real failure uh, probability is. For manned flight, this is where it gets tricky. NASA wouldn't like us not to kill any astronauts. Um, that's a pretty, that's pretty high bar. And I don't know if you just saw that Soyuz just had a failure on launch and they, they aborted and saved the astronauts. Uh, Russians build really great systems. I can talk for great lengths about some of the Russian systems. They're Magnifique. Uh, anyway, uh, so their probability for failure, though, is less than 5% at 90% at, at confidence level. So you have to start doing things like 45 flights. <laughs> and of course, you can't afford 45 flights. So, so the question is, well, what do you do to, to enable those high reliability and high confidence things without killing people? Um, and the, the, the rule in the industry, the aerospace industry, is test as you fly and fly as you test. 
Um, and that, again, this comes back to what the Navy was saying. This is, a, this is an air conditioned hangar that Boeing has that they got an F, I think this is Boeing, that has an F-22 in it, uh, that they're, they're testing to make sure the thing turns on at minus 45 degrees, because that's a part of their operating envelope. Um, good, I'll get to the, oh, wow, two minutes, okay. The other thing you do is you build in margin and redundancy as carefully as possible. So SpaceX, for instance, we have nine engines of the rocket. There's a couple of reasons for that, but one of the reasons is we can lose eight of these engines on ascent and still make it to orbit. And we design our systems so that we lose, if we don't lose those engines on ascent, we have leftover fuel and capacity to do stuff. And that gives us the opportunity to get paid to blow some things up. So basically every single one of these explosions here was for a mission, whoops, I promise, I know how to do this. There we go. Um, every single one of these missions, we successfully delivered the payload to orbit, uh, and we had leftover fuel. So we flipped the rocket end for end, and we tried landing it. We tried landing it on the ocean, um, and that actually works really well, except that there's nothing there, so it then tipped over and exploded. Um, this was a test facility in Texas. They let you blow anything up in Texas. Um, <laughs> Uh, that was the most amazing explosion we've ever, I've, like, it's amazing. And then we said, Elon, please don't go standing right next to the burning <laughs> rocket. This is, this is an incorrect evaluation of risk. Um, uh, this, we ran out of uh, propellant. These, I mean, boom. This, uh, put this in perspective, that's the size of a football field. The rocket, when it lands, is 10 stories tall. Um, so uh, that's a football field, postage stamp. Uh, that ended badly for everyone involved. Um, uh, we blew up, um, I'm going to get this number a little bit wrong, but we blew up about 11 rockets before we landed our first one. Um, that was a high pressure oxygen, uh, 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 gas bottle, high pressure um, GN2 bottle. Um, these things, uh, another fun thing to know about these rockets, they're 10 stories tall. Uh, when they launch, they're 95% fuel. So it's got a better mass fraction than a Coke can when it launches. Um, uh, this one landed and broke a leg. And so we couldn't get the crew on board to secure it because it was 12 foot seas. And so as it was getting back into port, it just rocked its way back and forth um, uh, over, over the deck. Uh, this Coast Guard had to come out and give us special dispensation to bring it in. Um, that one shut off at 12 feet instead of 12 inches. Um, that's not good. Um, uh, and so uh, the, the, mo the moral of the story here is you have to do a lot of testing. You have to do as realistic a testing as you can. And if you can structure your business or your enterprise so that you get paid for doing that testing, then you get to land on land and land on our drone ship. And uh, this last weekend, we landed in uh, um, uh, uh, Vandenberg, California. So we now have land landing on both coasts. Um, I'm out of time, so I'm going to just go ahead and start this video um, and then take any questions you'd like, and I'm happy to answer questions for as long as you want, um, given my inability to start the videos. Uh, this is Falcon Heavy. This was Starman, and it's just a beautiful video, and I'll just let it play. Um, and uh, um, uh, This one was a launch that we did not get paid for, um, uh, so Elon decided to fly his model, uh, his original Tesla Roadster. Um, and so uh, uh, the, the every one, uh, sorry, two out of three of these boosters had already flown before. So this was again another way where it starts. It's um, call it a self-licking ice cream cone or a virtuous cycle. If you can get the cost down and the testing up, and then you you, you can build that reliability in. Now you can start doing these these uh, um, positive reinforcing cycles. So uh, anyway, I'll leave that go. Thank you. I know this is cheating. Can you tell them about the new company you just oh, well, new company. Uh, so uh, I am uh, currently uh, looking at building uh, satellites on a similar model to SpaceX. Uh, the model that builds and manufactures many rockets is slightly different than the model that is uh, appropriate for building scientific instruments and payloads. Uh, and so I'm interested in applying some of the engineering systems that SpaceX has used into uh, things like uh, astronomical instruments and Earth observing instruments. So that's my current uh, future, at least for the next couple of years. Uh, Elon uh, wanted us to fly high definition cameras, and I was like, it's cool because it's in space. Like, don't need the high definition cameras. And then when the capsule fairing separated, and we have that picture of, of Elon, you're the smart one. You know, it's, you're, you're totally right. It's the most beautiful pictures. Um, Starman's on his uh, uh, way to Mars.
No, by the way, he's, he, it passes Mars orbit. Um, but actually, he would have been closer if you stayed on Earth. Um, so anyway, Thanks. in the back, please. Uh, someone who's worked uh, on the inside of uh, SpaceX, I'm curious uh, when, when you think we should expect to uh, start occupying Mars. <laughs> occupying Mars. Um, it's a great question. Um, uh, so the, uh, the, the big issue with going to Mars, obviously, is, is, is a long way away. And um, you need a, a new vehicle. We call it the Big Falcon rocket, the BFR. Um, uh, it, is, it is a Saturn V class rocket, um, uh, but fully reusable. Um, and uh, the, uh, you should be looking for a maiden flight of that in the kind of 2025 time frame. And then um, the ship, the part that goes to Mars in, say, the next five years after that. So if, if I were being, like, aggressive, I would say 2030-ish is when we'd be trying to, like, actually send something to Mars. Um, people, not people, it's a good question. I don't know. Um. One later. Uh, no, so the system is designed right now to be fully uh, to be a round trip, a uh, fully reusable round trip, um, uh, and uh, uh, you know people who go to Mars should have the option to come back. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I actually I, I I'm not sure that that's true. I mean, uh, it's it's also with the astronauts. You know, the astronauts get in the airplanes all the time that that will kill them. So. The question is to Mars orbit, not to Mars landing. No, Mars landing. Mars landing and launch from Mars. That's right. So. Um, uh, again, it goes a little bit to the margin story, but the, the, the thing that happens with a big rocket like that is you have to uh, use rocket propulsion to, to decelerate at, once you get to Mars and land. And you just carried all these big rocket engines all the way to Mars, so you might as well use them to come back again. Uh, and then the other really cool thing is that it's a methane LOX engine, and you can get both methane and LOX at Mars if you happen to have solar panels. So you begin to see some of the machinations here. And then when you get to Mars, you're going to have to live underground, so you have to learn how to tunnel. So doing the, it all, it all hangs together. Uh, uh, no, like reusability sort of getting to be like a more important factor in space flight. Like they tried it with the shuttle. The shuttle, I guess, was sort of, I mean, the, the success of its reusability was sort of put into question based on, you know, cost or whatever, but or even safety. But like, how does your analysis of rockets change, like given that you have to send them up multiple times or that you have to subject them to the same kind of stress on multiple times? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and in fact, it's kind of the driving question in this whole business. And I think if you were to talk to, like a tr like more traditional aerospace, they'd say it doesn't win you anything. Um, what SpaceX has found, we made money the first time we launched a reused rocket. It cost us less to refurb it and fly it than it would have been to build it from scratch. And now we get to use all of the factory that we were building rockets, building other things. And we get to take the, the, the thing that went to space and bring it back home, and we get to see how everything worked out, and we get to improve. All so we're starting to move from that don't screw it up model into that fleet model. And that has been hugely valuable. Uh, and so, so um, that part has been great. The other thing that happens is it's just like a jet engine. You know, you, f you flew in the first Messerschmitt um, uh, 109, and, and uh, you know you were lucky if that thing didn't blow up right behind you. Now they got a thousand hours on a turbine, and they've designed the turbine for a thousand hours. It means every single hour that thing is running is safer than than it ever could be. And so, by designing a rocket that can go do do reuse ten times reuse, hundred times reuse, it's just it it percolates through the entire enterprise, and it's been a huge win. So uh, in, in many different ways. Um, thank you. Thank you.